today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good things come in threes. Uh, we started with three paradoxes of the introduction. Uh, we now have a speaker, Dr. Uh, Gurevich, who is indeed three speakers in one. Uh, in Russia, uh, he was a famous algebraist, very successful. In Israel, he was a world-famous logician. Uh, in the United States, he's a wonderful and well-known computer scientist. So today, this three speakers in one is going to speak to us on what is an algorithm. I give you Dr. Yuri Gurevich. Now I have to live up to this introduction. So I actually had prepared the talk, but after listening yesterday, I put another part to it to react to a few things. Computable, calculable, questionable. Let me see, I actually don't see from here. So effectively, effectively calculable, I'll just say calculable, is calculable sort of in principle with unbounded resources. But there is another obvious principle that resources are bounded. So which of these two you choose? I choose the second. That's certainly true. Um, so we, the logicians, sort of hijacked the terms like computable and solvable, decidable. So the poor computer scientists have to use terms like feasible and tractable because those, the usual terms are already taken. So I was there in 1960s to witness the early optimism when people expected if something is decidable, it is decidable. So you just can sit down and compute. That didn't pan out that way. I should say, I will not dwell on feasibility, but I happen to be involved in various aspects of it. It is complex. Uh, somebody mentioned this yesterday, uh, what was it called? Optimism, rational optimism, that we eventually will solve every question. I don't think so, but we will advance in possibly unexpected ways. If we cannot solve it in the worst case, we try to solve it in average case. If average case doesn't work, we may try to approximate. So we achieve certain goals sometimes. So it's, it's a quite a complicated and involved story. So some so-called solvable problems are in fact very intractable, like Tarski algorithm for the real arithmetic. And some unsolvable problems in fact are tractable in certain uh, practical sense. So for example, the halting problem, there was a fellow in Cambridge, uh, England, called Byron Cook and has a tool called Terminator. And if you have a C program, then the chances are that he will tell you whether the program will terminate or not. Now, of course, as a, as a logician, you can trick this tool. But for practical purposes, it's quite, uh, quite useful. On the other hand, algorithms seem to me contrary to effective so-called effective calculability, seems to be unquestionably uh, useful and very ubiquitous. If you think about it, programs, programming languages are algorithms. The language itself, why? Think about programming language as a as a universal machine which takes a program and data and runs this program on that data. So it's kind of algorithm, operating systems, almost anything in computer science is, is, an, is an algorithm. So the foundational question, what is an algorithm, 
is, uh, seems to be a, of paramount importance. And it happens to be very practical as well. Uh, so in my case, I started it as, a, as a, something which was just curious to me. I was, came from math into computer science and wanted to understand what do they do? Uh, what is computer science about? You know, like in physics, they study particles and all kinds of things, but at the end, they write PDEs, partial differential equations. So what are the partial differential equations of computer science? And um, I convinced myself that uh, uh, it's all about algorithms, and if we can have a good way to write algorithms that may play the role of sort of PDEs of uh, computer science. <laughs> And the question is practical, so in, in my particular case, eventually Microsoft became interested and that's how that same investigation brought me to Microsoft. So algorithms not necessarily compute functions. Algorithms do various tasks. Think about an operating system. You know, what function does it compute? And it's one of those cases you don't want it to terminate. So some algorithms do compute functions. It's a kind of special kind of tasks, rather narrow. So to me, the, the right question is not what computable or effectively calculable functions are, but what are the algorithms? And the two questions are related. I'll, in, in a couple of slides, I'll, I'll relate them. So concerning Church's thesis, and also Turing, the goal, the goal was to, to prove that the Entscheidung's problem is undecidable. So the goal was the negative. From that point of view, inflating the notion of computable was quite all right. It made your negative result only more powerful. And uh, so, so it seems to be somewhat questionable to take this positive definition of computable computable or effectively calculable so seriously. But in any case, to connect algorithms um, and uh, computable functions, one way to reformulate this is as follows. So for any functions from natural numbers to natural numbers, the following two are equivalent. Instead of effectively calcul calculable, I would say there exists an algorithm that computes the function. Now, the algorithm is a finite object. So th this is a, a, a clear question. Yesterday, some people say that you have to define something as finite. Some people say, we will ignore them. <laughs> um, some people say we have to define what's defined. <laughs> okay, and this is one, and it's equivalent to what is recursive. That's the thesis. Of course, we need to, to clarify the notion of algorithm. But if we clarify, then this thesis becomes clear. Is it possible to define algorithms? Since I promised a lecture to explain what an algorithm is, maybe a bit surprising, my answer is to this question is no. Not in full generality. And the reason is that the notion of algorithms keeps expanding. So somewhat similar to the notion of numbers that what uh, Stuart alluded to, speaking about. So you. Initially, we had natural numbers, zero and negative numbers, and rational and reals. 
imaginary, and we are not necessarily done. Similarly with algorithms. In Turing's time, in 1950s, until 1960s, essentially, it was more or less clear what's an algorithm. Not all algorithms are Turing algorithms. Say, ruler and compass, and not. But, uh, so I'll, I'll speak more about it. But then came parallel algorithm, interactive, distributed algorithms, real-time algorithms, uh, quantum algorithms, and we're definitely not done. Because now genetic algorithms uh, and algorithms. So, uh, however, some strat of algorithms have matured, and those we at least have a chance of capturing, of formalizing. Now, why bother? There are many interesting questions in the world. For example, ideal mind, ideal machine, and the re relations between the two. Uh, so, first, scientific curi curiosity. Some things can be pinned down, some things cannot be. Uh, Typical in computer science, people say uh, a language, uh, programming language is Turing complete. Okay. And it seems to them, or to many, if it's Turing complete, it's rich enough. But it takes very little to, get, to be Turing complete. So a very poor language may be Turing complete. So, I'll return to this. Let me ignore this universal stuff. Otherwise, I will never take too much time to, to, give, to give it justice. Uh, second, oops. There are practical applications. Let me see, where is the, uh, like software specification. <coughs> Let's see, why software specification? So as I said, algorithms are ubiquitous. Everything is an algorithm, say, operating system. And algorithms appear on various levels of abstraction. And specification is a very important thing in, in development of software. You know, if, if hundreds of people develop some piece of software, they have to know what they're doing. So it's desirable to specify it ahead of time. But what we specify is an algorithm, possibly very high level. Um, and you have to specify it. Now, there was, when I started this, the dominating camp was something which appeals to logicians. Um, oh, what's the word? Declarative. People thought that specification should be declarative. It's clean, but this declarative is good, but not, not good enough, because if you have specification which is declarative, you cannot, uh, imagine you're a software engineer, you have a book, you have to study this book, but software is a living body, it changes. You cannot play with a book. So you need specification itself to be a piece of software with which you can experiment. Ah, to com uh, coming back to Turing completeness, there is something more, a richer notion is algorithmic completeness, that you have all algorithms of certain kind that you want to express in your language. And I'll speak what does mean express. Okay, analysis of computations, there were several analyses. So there was a brilliant analysis of Turing. Uh, it's a kind of stream of conscience. When you read it, it's so convincing. When you start to think about it, it's very difficult to pin down what are, what are the precise assumptions. 
What does it mean that there is a finite many states of mind of, of the computer? So it succeeded tremendously. So the undecidability, uh, universal Turing machine, a couple of weeks ago there was an historian at Microsoft Research gave a lecture and gave, showed documents that for Neumann, for Neumann what called phenomenon architecture, that Feynman's team was influenced by Turing. So this, this is a fact, there are documents. Uh, one interesting irony, it was a, a great thing was that programs were data and data were programs. So it was the strength of original approach turns out to be a great weakness of software today because uh, software hides as a data of a really program. Just a side remark. Uh, Compl uh, complexity theory was enabled by Turing machines. In a sense, Turing machines became too successful. People just, uh, so there are some serious people who claim in books that algorithms are Turing machine. Can you imagine Turing machine which will work on like operating system? Uh, in brilliant people who develop interactive uh, uh, complexity, interactive complexity, uh, based it on Turing machines, as if, if, if Turing machine is universal for func functions from strings to strings, it remains universal for other purposes. Of course, it, it doesn't have to remain universal. But anyway, in 1953, Kolmogorov uh, came with another model, and in the in the his original note, and then uh, with his student Uspensky, five years later they published a lengthy paper. There was no philosophy. They just say we want to convince ourselves in the veracity of Turing thesis. Now his student Leonid Levin tells me that in fact there was a spatial analysis behind, um, uh, it's hard to gesticulate in one hand, with one hand, um, b behind uh, Kolmogorov's analysis. So instead of analyzing a, a man computing, so he analyzed computation in uh, space and time. So each you know, piece uh, somewhere in space has in, in its vicinity only so many other pieces. So this kind of principle of locality. And that's where Turing, uh, Kolmogorov machine came. Uh, it wasn't as consequential as Turing, partially also because in, in the West they learned much later about the Kolmogorov machines. But uh, it, it, it allowed finer complexity theory. For example, he asked his students, whether standard way we multiply um, integers, which we learn in school, whether this is an optimal way. And it turns out not. So students from his seminar came with uh, answers and, and improved algorithms, and uh, one of them, Karatsubi, the Adain, the champion of that uh, direction. And there are more, more, this is one example of this, fine. The problem was that when you compile all to Turing, the, the, these fine differences disappear. Gandhi, his goal was what can calculated by a machine is computable, is computable. And if I understand correctly his introduction, the motivations was two motivations. One, the, that um, Turing analysis didn't account for parallelism. I would not take this man too, too seriously. The man, that, you know, human, that com computer, that uh, Turing writes about, it, it's a metaphor. It's a machine, of course. 
there is nothing human with this man, no emotions, no tiredness, and anything. But it definitely sequential. So this is one motivation. Another motivation is the, the assumptions of Turing is hard to pinpoint, and so uh, it would be interesting to write down clear, simpler assumptions and from them derive thesis, and that's what he did. So Gandhi's thesis, a discrete deterministic mechanical device satisfies certain principles. Uh, yesterday, Stuart uh, told us that it's a, 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 a genius penetrate, I forgot the world, analysis. I, I'm not so sure, I don't know what he's talking about, which devices. The standard device to compute functions is computer, not PC. Today's computers are multi-core. So they definitely don't fit uh, the very first postulate. Um, and this is only one uh, asynchrony. There was a synchrony present in computers of 1980. Uh, also, this, by the way, this very first postulate was used in a very f famous in, in uh, um, specification literature school called VDL, Vienna Definition Language, developed by Vienna Lab of IBM. Uh, they also, they said, okay, not uh, literally the same, but very close, that every state is a graph. So in, in fact, uh, Gandhi also says a graph, but of, of a particular kind. And at the time, there were already several mod, uh, very popular models which were very um, <laughs> intensely investigated. One of them was parallel RAM, parallel random access machine. Another is a circuit model. So it's interesting, from 1930s when logicians were at the bleeding edge of technological progress, maybe even ahead, <laughs> but by 1980s, logicians were somewhat behind. Okay, yet another analysis. That's the beginning of my original talk. So definitely there are not Turing algorithms. I mentioned already ruler and compass, Gauss illumination procedure. So the algorithms accepted by mathematicians for centuries, even millennia, and they are not Turing. And uh, Turing didn't, didn't pretend. He very explicitly said that he speaks about symbolic, or what the, like today we would say digital algorithm, algorithms. And then there are various non-sequential algorithms, but We'll start with sequential because that's the strata, uh, stratum that matured best. Oh, here is, oh, it, let me get it. It's written for students, so I think that. So ruler and compass algorithm, uh, in a, a, it's very um, algorithms at least this one definitely sequential. Never mind what this particular one is. Just I want to show. Another one, this is bisection. You take, what's the problem with ruler and compass? You just cannot put the input on, on the tape of Turing machine. It's not, not discrete. In here you have any continuous function and given the value of f between two points, you want to find close enough point where it is, um, a point where the function is close to zero. And there's an obvious algorithm, you just bisect repeatedly. And here the algorithm is written here. But definitely not Turing. So Turing uh, machines operate on the level of single bits. even more narrow. 
Kolmogorov machines operate on level single bits. So in one of my papers, I made a conjecture that a real goal of Kolmogorov was to capture algorithms on the level of single bits. And Uspensky, the surviving co-author of that, their common paper, uh, he agrees. He, when he speaks now on that subject, he puts quotation in my paper. And, um, no, he, he cannot speak 100% for Kolmogorov, but he concurs that it, it, consistent with what he understands. Okay. So, what occurred to me, it, it would be a kind of a dream to have a machine model which operates on any level of abstraction, on a level of single bits, on very abstract level, and any, anywhere in between. And it seems it's too good to be true. But then you say, okay, even if it's not true, how would such a machine look like? Hmm? Like human being. <laughs> Switching him off. <laughs> So, so the analysis led to me to something which I called uh, abstract state machines. Initially, they were only sequential. Let's see, I think I'm missing a... S okay. No mind. And to the following thesis. For every sequential algorithm, there is a behaviorally equivalent sequential ASM. I will give precise definition what is behavioral equivalent, but it is much more than they compute the same function. Later, with Andreas Blas and other collaborators, we generalized all, all the stuff to parallel in dis distributed algorithms, and later yet came axiomatic definitions. Ah, okay. So, from now on, and I concentrate to sequential algorithms. Everything will be sequential. Now, the question is, what does a sequential really mean? Uh, and here is how Kolmogorov, I think, quite uh, cleverly and succinctly formulated which algorithms are sequential. Algorithms, he said, at the time there were no, algorithm, no other algorithms. So he speaks about sequential algorithms. Algorithms compute in steps. So first of all, there's a step, step after step after step. So there's this sequence, but also in steps of bounded complexity. They're definitely not parallel. The complexity of one step is bounded. In other words, algorithm, there are two th thoughts here. One is the algorithm is a kind of transition system. And the second, that the amount of work done within any one step is bounded independently of the initial state. So for any initial state, there is some bound such that for any initial step, state, and for any step from that state, the amount of work is bounded by that number. So formal definition was paper, and now I, I will explain it. First postulate just says, well, the first formalizes, and it's a kind of trivial part, first part of Kolmogorov definition, that algorithm is a transition system. So it goes from state to state. So only two questions remain. What's a state and what's a transition? Once Knut quipped in the beginning of AI, which probably uh, mildly irritated him, the popularity of that, he said, what's AI? Ah, there, he said, there are two main questions in a AI. What is A and what is I? So something similar is here. <laughs> 
So if, even though this first postulate, one of three, is so trivial, it allows us to define behavioral equivalence. So we will say that two algorithms, sequential algorithms, are behaviorally equivalent if they have same states and, same transition in, and the same transition function. So from the point of view of behavior, they're identical. So you say, what's the difference? Syntax. One may be written in one language, not in another language. And when I spoke about uh, algorithmic complexity, uh, completeness, you may show that such and such language is algorithmically complete. So for every algorithm of certain class, say sequential algorithm, it has a program which will simulate the algorithm um, in, which will be behaviorally equivalent to the given algorithm. By the way, uh, if two algorithms are behaviorally equivalent, then in between states, the environment can in come and change state in any way, but in the same way in both cases, and then they will proceed uh, identically. So there is this interaction that the environment can impose states. So informally, a state, by the way, in uh, com computer science book, the definition of state is usually wrong. Typically, they say that the state is um, given by the values of the variables. And this is just not true. Um, in fact, this is a source of difficulty of programming semantics. The programming languages hide complexity and expose to you certain variables and give you impression of much simpler reality. But in fact, the, the state is, say, I don't know what, whatever language you know, Pascal or C, uh, the, the, um, there is a stack, if language uses recursion, there is a stack with various unfinished com computations on that stack, and this is part of a state. The future development depends on this not only on the values. Suppose you have a C program with three variables X, Y, Z, you know X, Y, Z. Do you know, uh, for example, the next step, state? Not necessarily. You have to know where um, program counter is. And if at that moment you popped up your, your stack, then you have to know what uh, below the surface is. So intuitively, the state is in uh, information piece of information sufficiently rich so that together with the program, it, it determines the future of the program. Modular uh, environment interference. So the second state is <coughs> The second postulate is that states are st structures in the sense of mathematical logic. In a sense, it goes back to Tarski. So in Michigan, for, for years, I had two computers, two workstations, one at home, one in the office. One was called Turing, one was Tarski. So in his famous paper on, on, the, on truth definition, he argues that this, what, um, that, that structures are faithful representations of static mat mathematical reality. And that's what states are. So it was actually useful to be a logician coming to computer science. Uh, these people in Vienna lab, very talented people, but graphs seem to them sufficiently rich. But in fact, states are maybe much, much richer and also typically infinite. Uh, let me ignore this. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to explain. It's very convincing. But let me go to the main step and then I'll 
happy to answer questions. There is some closure on the isomorphism condition. That's what you expect. That's the abstract part. So every structure is a kind of representation of a state. Two isomorphic structures represent the same state. And if you make a step, then there is, you can make a step and then take isomorphic image. Or you take first isomorphic image and then the step. And then you arrive to the same point. Okay. And that's, that's the third part of uh, the last line. What still remains and this, this two postulate I got almost immediately. And then it took me a dozen of years or more to figure out, in, in a sense, uh, Kolmogorov's problem. What does, how to make a, um, step bounded? What does it mean that step is bounded, of bounded complexity? So in complexity theory, there is no such thing. Typically, what they speak in complexity theory is the number of steps. But what does it mean that one step is bounded? I mean, bound on every single step, that single step is bounded. What does it mean? So, uh, let's see, this is. The question is whether variables are part of uh, you should the of the variables, how they fit in Shh. There's a protocol. You ask the question? No. <laughs> the question is whether values of the variables are part of the structure. You should go back to take uh, logic 101. Of course variables are not part of the structure. Part of the structure are constants, relations, operations or functions, structure has no variables. Logic does, but that's a separate story. We speak about structure. It's a model theory, not proof theory. And a lecture is not a duet, <laughs> it's, it's solo. So, let me motivate a, a bit. So, imagine, you execute a sequential program. Um, think about a state as a kind of huge thing, and you being a little ant, you can see only a small part of a state. So what can you do? Now, and remember that state is abstract. So you cannot say that this element of, uh, element of the state is seven. Or, uh, no, but this cannot be an element. It can be an element of the state, but you would not recognize that. You as an algorithm cannot recognize elements because you should work the same way on isomorphic structures. So the only way for you to interact with a structure is via the structure vocabulary. So, for example, you can say, give me, if you have constant C, you can say C. You can name an element. Or you can say F of C, get another element. So the only way you can name elements in a structure is by producing a term. And intuitively, in, in program is a finite object, and only so many terms are appear. So that's kind of motivation. Uh, this, uh, this is the most difficult postulate in truly motivated would develop, it would take um, time. But let me jump to conclusion. So the, the bounded exploration postulate is that for every algorithm, independently of state or, or initial state or current state, for algorithm itself, algorithm itself is associated with a fixed number of terms, in the sense of first order logic, bound to, uh, ground terms without variables. And these are the only terms that evaluated during any one step. And that's the bound on complexity. 
In other words, these are the only terms that I explored. And it, it's very easy to get them in any, pract in any re um, example, because typically those are the terms which actually appear in the program. Sometimes you have to close under, down on the subterms. So the, uh, originally I thought I have more time. So if we would look closer to that bisection algorithm, that, uh, so these are the critical terms for that bisection algorithm. So now we can, we are ready to give the, uh, a definition of an algorithm. So an algorithm is any entity which satisfies the three postulate. In other words, any transition system which satisfies the abstract state and bounded exploration postulates. Now, two questions are right. Is three postulate enough? Maybe we need a few more. And why should you buy these postulates? Now, why should you buy these postulates? Yeah. This is not religion. This is science. I put them forward as postulates, as, as kind of first principles of sequential algorithms. And I'm very eager to hear arguments. I say this for a long, long time. And I, I haven't heard, usually people buy. So if there are some critical minds here who will uh, argue against uh, these first principles, I, I'm extremely eager to, to hear. But the other question, whether we need more postulate, the answer is no. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't have time to define sequential abstract state machine. It actually takes uh, one slide, but I didn't. Um, so sequential abstract state machines are obviously algorithms satisfied. Uh, algor uh, obviously algorithms in the same sense, rec obviously recursive functions. Not so, let me forget recursive functions. Turing machines are algorithms, or Kolmogorov machines are algorithms. And um, uh, a theorem in the paper is uh, that for every algorithm, for every entity satisfying the three postulates, there exists an algorithm, and there exists an abstract state machine which is behaviorally equivalent, has the same states and the same, and the same transition function. So it's a very close capture of notion of algorithms. One objection sometimes I hear that behavioral equivalence is way too fine a relation. For example, I'm interested, often people say, in, say, by simulation. Why do I need to be more refined than that? Uh, but notice that finer the refinement, finer the notion of uh, equ equivalence, of behavioral equivalence, stronger the result. So the representation theorem also, it, it trivially, uh, extends to by, um, to any kind of coarser equivalence, in particular to by simulation, so so beloved by some by British computer science. Back to church. <laughs> so from my point of view, problem was solved, and uh, and, and the right thing is. Uh, algorithms. Now, ASMs can compute uncomputable functions. Why? Because the, an initial state may have uncomputable functions. The initial state may be not computable. So I never saw it as a, as a problem because um, you should always consider algorithms in the presence of oracles. So these initial functions are kind of oracles. And then Nahum appeared, Nahum Dershowitz, and uh, he was interested in constructivity, the initial state should be constructive, and so we had this, so we set to derive Church's thesis 
from three parcels, three, three parcels. Now, you cannot de derive, three parcels are more general. So, for example, um, this bisection algorithm that works on, on uh, continuous function satisfies all three postulates. Gauss elimination algorithm, such as it's, it's an algorithm, it's a sequential algorithm in that sense. That um, algorithm that I showed you, um, also uh, an algorithm. And, and in, in both two cases, it was bisection and with ruler and compass, there were programs on the slide, and the programs were abstract state machines, little abstract state machines. So obviously we need an additional postul postulate, which is supposed to rule out all the oracles, the granal oracles, that's, that's the meaning. So this is George's thesis. Actually, George was very lucky to have uh, good students. You know, you know the first he, uh, he wanted to prove the, to use lambda calculus to replace set theory, to have functional uh, alternative you probably all know Eastern better than, uh, than me. Uh, but anyway, um, he created a system of lambda calculus which was supposed to compete, and his students, Pliny and Ross, are good students, they so good that they demolished his system. But contrary to Frege, who, you know, after receiving this postcard from Russell never published the word. Church wasn't that kind. He said, okay, let's lambda card to see what can we do with it. Um, and then he made this lucky guess. And then Kleene came in with such reverence to his teacher. <laughs> he corrected uh, from the thesis. He called it a thesis. And he corrected uh, the thesis by uh, generalizing to partial functions and attach church's name to it. I, uh, from my point of view, may, maybe it's unfair, but I, I'm not a historian. It seems to me the church just made a lucky guess, and the real hero is Turing. In fact, somebody mentioned here that we have so many systems, and that's why we believe church's thesis. This is a bogus argument. This only proof since so many systems are equivalent from the point of view of what function they compute. It only proves that the notion is robust. It doesn't prove that it's right. Besides, there are not so many systems. Uh, there is uh, lambda, independently, lambda calculus, recursive functions, and Turing machines. The rest uh, came after that. People knew. So there are not, not so many systems. Okay, this is quotation, famous quotation from Gödel. It's kind of motivate, motivate the study. I wish I knew it before starting <laughs> the study. Uh, our paper is very scholarly, not because of me, because Nahum is scholarly. And. Uh, so we formulated the fourth postulate. So it, it, it can be postulated in various ways. The, 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 the spirit of this additional postulate is that the, in the initial state there are no oracles. Only undeniably say you may have zero and, and the successor in the initial state. It somewhat depends how do you think of, of uh, real number, of natural numbers. No, logicians think about natural numbers as zero and successor. Computer scientists will use binary notation. They Two successors. Thank you. Fortunately, I'm coming to the end. And now, from these four principles, you just prove a theorem. Notice, we do not prove Church's uh, thesis from, from nothing. That's surely impossible. You can only prove something about two mathematics. 
one mathematical object and one informal or open texture, whatever you call it, there is no way to, to prove everything. What we, you can do, I think at a maximum, you can formulate simpler assumptions, uh, kind of first principles, and derive the theory from first principles. It, now the question remains, are these really first principles? Should we believe them? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got uh, uh, a question and a comment perhaps. Uh, at the beginning you mentioned the unbounded resources, that resources are actual bounded. I think that this is not so much important because uh, uh, the unbounded resources is just a theoretical aim to achieve uh, computable properly partial functions. Otherwise, we wouldn't need that theoretical uh, assumption of unbounded resources. So I agree. And that is why I think it's much cleaner to speak instead of that function is calculable, which creates an impression, and then many philosophers take it for real, that you actually can compute. Much cleaner to speak that there exists an algorithm. Yeah. So there is a recipe of computing. And then, as much as resources you have, as much as you can compute. Yes. And the question, I'm not sure whether I fully uh, grasp your notion of bounded, uh, bounded uh, complexity or bounded exploration. It seems to me that it is uh, equivalent to, uh, say, a finite uh, declarative of basic constructions, if I used my language. Uh, but if you define algorithm as a system of states and transition function, then I, the question is uh, bounded exploration, does it, is it sufficient for bounded complexity? I mean, uh, that you, uh, uh, did you, do you take into account the, the execution of the transition? Because, because there may, maybe that trick of say, uh, infinitely small time of the execution of particular transition steps and uh, the same problem sequential versus parallel uh, these are equivalent so uh, we might even say that they are the same algorithms unless unless we take into account execution time so so the the, the question is unbounded complexity but uh, was there Bounded exploration is sufficient, and whether you can or whether you do ignore uh, uh, the problem of execution of the transition step, of a transition step. So let's see. Contrary to, to Gandhi, it, it's not about physics. It, it is about software. In software, there are levels of abstraction. Always. So one level is, they, people, they say that uh, uh, computers operate on level of zeros and ones, often, you know, newspapers, right? This is only one level of abstraction. In fact, below them there is electrical reality. And there is a huge effort to enforce the zero and one illusion. Similarly, there is, when you program, you don't program in machine language, you can program in machine language, can program in assembly language, and so on. So, so there are these realities. That's kind of algorithm I'm talking about. In physical time, doesn't play a role in sequential algorithm. There is another class of algorithm called real-time algorithms, where it's explicit. For example, it may have an instruction, do something within five milliseconds you know, kind of algorithms people use in airplanes in, to, to keep airplanes in the air. So physical time doesn't... Uh, so how do you count work you do? So in fact, I didn't count, it's possible, but instead, 
of bounding war, uh, what I bounded, exploration. You explore only so many terms. So, so there is, say, seven terms, and in each state you compute seven terms. Okay. In that sense, it's bounded. It's not fine. Finite is, you, you can be vastly parallel and yet, yet finite. So it's much stricter than finite. It's bounded. Independently of input, independently of current state, there is a bound. You compute seven terms, full stop. Now, as you, you say, you don't com completely grasp or completely agree with this postulate. I, I think this is reasonable because you know, in the class, when I explain it, it takes a long time to motivate it from various sides and, and arrive. So I gave a very quick introduction. So let me stop at this. OK, thank you. I give up the technical question I wanted to understand before about the development and ask you just another question. Ever since you did any fancy to understand the notion of isomorphism. Okay, so isomorphism is, is a kind of function in certain, in certain properties. In order to understand what is a state, I need to understand the pieces of isomorphism. And I should be able to, to identify when some, some state is in isomorphism. Should it be computed by isomorphism or any isomorphism? Any. And so the notion of the state is, is something that we cannot really know. We might not know the two things are isomorphic. True. So the basic of this, okay, if you should you find or understand saying what is isomorphism, and I really don't know, I'm not, I don't know it here, and you tell me that the state is something that you can't even really describe. Okay. Look, the word no is very tre treacherous. <laughs> but the f let's see, the notion of bounded, of um, behavioral equivalence is so tight that to algorithm, that um, it, let's see, imagine your algorithm and there are seven terms that you compute. Now, the two states may be vastly different. The real notion, what, what you, let me, oh, just one second. So the, the question arises, in a given step, what matters? So maybe I should say a more technical, um, technical form of this um, bounded exploration. Technical form is this. Suppose you have two states which may be vastly different. I don't care about isomorphism. Isomorphism was here for, just for explanation. Take any two states, say A and B. If I'm, I'm an algorithm and my critical terms, I have seven critical terms. I compute several critical terms in, in the left state and I compute seven critical terms in the right state. If in each case, I get exactly the same elements, literally the same elements. Then, what's then? I'm not claiming that the next states will be the same, because the state may be so hugely different, knowing these seven elements will not do me any good. What I'm claiming, that if I computed exactly the same elements in both cases, I cannot possibly see the difference. So the delta that I computed, the change from this state to next state, the change, and this, there is a technical definition of what, what this delta means, the change, is identical in both cases. So that's the technical, that's, that's, right, so it is much, much stronger and much more uh, um, knowable and much more, um, constructive, the, the, the true, true definition.